Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Tuesday Tune. My name's Steve, I run horse sprung suspension up here in Whistler, and this week we're going to be following on with high and low speed damping uh, and how to set it up. So in last week's video, actually two weeks ago, we didn't do a video last week uh, because we just launched a new product called the Luft Cup and that has been taking up all our attention. The previous video was about uh, the theory behind high and low speed damping, how they overlap, how they interact. So this week we're going to go into more of the practicalities of setting them up. Uh, most commonly this is to do with compression damping, but there is elements of this that are applicable to rebound as well. So let's step into it and uh, have a look at the easiest and most efficient way to get your damping set up. So there are realistically two possible ways of doing this. Uh, there is the completely foolproof but slower way, and there is the less foolproof but often more efficient manner. So the ways, the two ways of doing it are what we call bracketing, which is essentially picking one extreme and the other, seeing which one you like more, going halfway in between your favorite one, uh, halfway in between two, picking a favorite out of those, and so forth. And that way you can basically just keep dividing the increments in half uh, until you find what works for you. That can be very slow with each adjuster though. Uh, and it also doesn't really take into account the effect that each adjuster has on the others. So it's always going to be an iterative setup um, in that you are gonna test one setup, go, okay, this needs to change, this needs to change. Um, and different elements of your suspension setup will affect each other. For example, as we discussed last week, uh, the amount of low speed support that you can get at maximum is uh, affected heavily by your high speed damping setting. The other way to do it, obviously, is to try to identify uh, what ride characteristics are the responsibility of what adjuster. Uh, and the difficulty here is that there is a lot of overlap. For example, if you increase your high speed compression too much, you can make the thing harsh. If you increase the low speed compression damping too much, you can make the thing harsh. If you slow your rebound down too much, you can make the thing harsh. So all of those can have similar effects. So that is definitely the less foolproof way to do it. Uh, but if you do know what you're doing, if you're more advanced when it comes to setup, then it can be helpful. So first of all, uh, before we go into either of those, let's have a quick look at the way that your the, the limitations of your suspension in terms of the velocities that you can see. Uh, and from that, we can try to understand a bit better where the high and the low speed uh, become most applicable. So behind me here, I have a graph that shows basically a plot. This is an outline of the maximum velocity that you will see in compression or in rebound at any point in the travel. And so this is based on actual data that we've measured on the bike. Um, but basically, notably, what you'll see is that you can see very high velocities almost anywhere in the compression stroke. The very highest velocities tend to be quite early in the travel, uh, and the very highest velocities that you will see come from slapping down on the ground uh, once you've left the ground. So off big jumps and whatnot, especially anything to flat. When that wheel first contacts, you get very, very high velocity. Because that always happens early in the stroke, uh, with spring force and the uh, spring force is lowest, and the damping hasn't had a lot of time to slow anything down yet, nor has the spring. Um, you tend to see the peak velocities in this sort of region of you know. 20% travel. As the uh, spring forces pick up and you get closer and closer to 100% travel over here, uh, these spring forces basically limit the maximum velocities that you'll see because those movements are usually starting earlier in the travel. So the wheel has already accelerated up to the speed uh, and it is now in this long gap. So notably in rebound, what we see here with this outline is essentially that highest velocities we're seeing are very close to bottom out. So the furthest into the travel, and the reason for that is that the spring is really what dictates the maximum amount of force that we have available uh, to accelerate the wheel. So where we have the highest forces available to accelerate the wheel and to overcome the rebound damping, uh, obviously that is where the spring force lies. Now let's have a look at the difference between compression and rebound in terms of the interaction of high and low speed here. So with very, very high speed events um, where we're basically starting, you know, bike leaves the ground, slaps down on the ground, wheel starts moving very, very quickly. Um, 
this shaded area here is essentially the low speed. And so what we can see is that it is very quickly able to get through um, the low speed compression damping, whereas the low speed rebound damping is a much more substantial part, a much more substantial fraction of the total velocities that we'll see in rebound. Whereas in compression, you know, if that's at say half a meter a second, you can easily see velocities eight meters a second in your fork. That is a small fraction of uh, the peak velocities that you'll see, and it can push through there very quickly. With the um, rebound damping, however, at a similar sort of thing, if we have a digressive curve, uh, like in you know, boxer World Cups, pre-charger ones, or your Cancrete double barrel, Fox X2, and so forth, um, anything that has a high and low speed adjuster, the difference in uh, the part of the velocity profile that the low speed controls compared to the high speed is a much larger fraction. So the low speed adjuster is proportionally much more effective um, in rebound than it is in compression. So what we'll see with a velocity versus time profile of single impact uh, that goes, compresses the, extent, uh, compresses the suspension and then allows it to rebound is something that starts at zero velocity, static position, whether that's fully topped out or whatever accelerates up, reaches a certain speed, decelerates, goes into the negative, which is rebound, reaches a certain peak speed, and then decelerates in rebound from there. So what that shows us there is that if we have a low speed region that is like that somewhere, and like that somewhere, so that anywhere in here is affected by low speed compression damping, and anywhere in here, it's affected by low speed rebound damping. The amount of time that this is in there, uh, in compression is obviously a lot less, in rebound it's a lot more. So what we can also see is that at both ends of the compression, so as it starts compressing, as it slows down, and as it stops compressing, it passes through the low speed compression. This here can actually be fairly critical. Um, if that is too heavily damped, then what can happen is that you get something where this takes too long to reach, to accelerate to peak velocity, and then all of a sudden the axle has to get out of the way of the bump, you get something like that. Obviously, the higher the velocity, the more the damping force, the more harshness that you feel. So, let's look at an order of operations for setting these up. My recommendation is, first of all, spring rate, Front and rear. Obviously spring rate is the single most important part of your suspension setup other than your tires. Secondly, low speed rebound, front and rear. Just get a feel for it. Uh, in the car park is fine, bouncing up and down. Get something that is controlled uh, without being excessively slow and you know, isn't coming back like a pogo stick. Next thing is your high speed damping on the trail. The reason uh, that I advise setting your high-speed damping first is because once you have your high-speed damping set then that will give you uh, a good idea of the limitations of the range of the low-speed damping that you can get. So as we discussed again on the last video, how much high-speed damping uh, you run through the adjusters affects the maximum amount of low-speed that you can get from your adjusters but before it just basically makes it harsh. So in compression in particular uh, you can't get more than a certain amount of support out of your low speed compression adjuster um, unless there is a sufficient preload on the high speed circuit. Otherwise, uh, what happens is that you just choke off the flow through the low speed circuit and you get that delayed reaction there, uh, which leads to harshness but doesn't give you more support. Once you have your high speed rebound and compression set up on the trail, now these don't have to be done in any particular order. They should both be done as you feel it is necessary. Uh, then you can look at your low speed compression, which is essentially the least important part of it all. Um, the high speed rebound and low speed rebound, often you'll only have a single adjuster. Um, and even when you don't, most of the time the low speed rebound adjuster is actually the dominant. And this is especially true on the RockShox products. So once we've gotten through there, through low speed, 
Uh, you can go back to your high speed compression and damping if you find that your low speed, you're not able to get enough support out of your low speed damping. Um, if you run through the full gamut of your external settings, then if you need further changes, internal valving is the way to do it. Now this brings up another note. We can only get requests from people to be custom tuning their stuff, which is fine. We can do that by the numbers, but if you haven't actually tried to get the most out of your external adjusters, we can give you something that's better than that, but it's probably not as good as it could be. So what we really want to see from our customers is that they have made some effort to set up their suspension uh, with the adjustments that they have to the best of their abilities. Once we get to the point where uh, the external adjustments are no longer the right avenue to improvement, then we'll look at internal valve. Before that, like I said, we can make an improvement. If you're gonna spend that kind of money though, let's do it as best we can. All right, so bracketing. Bracketing is a very simple and foolproof uh, way of going about setup uh, because all you have to really do is pick whether you want something, uh, whether you like one setup more than another. So you start at extremes of your setup. So these here are your clicks of rebound, uh, starting at minus zero. So zero clicks out from full slow, going to minus 20, theoretical, hypothetical adjuster. Um, I don't really recommend starting right at the extreme ends because they're usually unrideable. Start at the extreme ends of what is actually rideable at all um, and then we can work within that range. So here we're starting at 18 clicks out, riding at 18 clicks out, riding it at 2 clicks out. Seeing which one you like better, uh, they're both going to suck, this is kind of the point, but one will be better than the other. So if you prefer 2 clicks out, then we compare that to something halfway in between the two. So we go from 18 clicks two clicks, halfway in between is 10 clicks out. So between two clicks out and 10 clicks out, we then look at what do I prefer from those two. Okay, well two clicks felt too slow, 10 clicks is feels a bit off, but it's better. So let's go from 10 clicks. Let's have a look at uh, between 10 clicks and the two clicks, we we'll go halfway there. So we're going to, let's say six clicks, um, and whether we find that better than 10 clicks. The answer is, in this case, no, we don't find that better than 10 clicks. So 10 clicks is still our baseline. So we go uh, between the six clicks out and the 10 clicks out for our next set. Uh, and at that point, we're looking at eight clicks out. We go, okay, yeah, that actually does feel better than 10 clicks out. So that is our new baseline. So that's our new favorite. We go to here, go, okay, well, we'll try halfway in between the eight clicks and the 10 clicks, go to nine clicks and go, okay, that feels even better. There we are, all sorted. Uh, it is a very simple and effective way of doing things that way because there isn't really too much to be concerned about in terms of knowing what the adjustments do, you just pick what you like better. Um, for most people, this is a really good way of setting things up. So one last word before we go, um, a lot of manufacturers do provide baseline settings to start from. Uh, they will, like Cane Creek, uh, do a really good example, a really good job of this. For example, starting with the manufacturer's recommended settings is usually a really good way to start. Uh, like I said, Cane Creek do a really bang up job of giving you very useful settings uh, off the bat, particularly for the bikes that they have actually specifically tried. Um, now you do need to obviously adjust according to your weight and the way that you ride. They are baselines, they're not you know, finishing points, they're starting points. but look up all the information that you can get from the manufacturer first that will give you a good idea of whether uh, of where to start and you know something that's vaguely in the ballpark sometimes you'll even find that that is the best setup that you can get because these guys are actually quite good at their jobs anyway that's all we have time for this week on Tuesday Tune um, any questions feedback of course let us know we always want to hear it and uh, we'll see you next week